Come on, maestro! Hit it! At the fourth academy of Sioux City, Principal Shui Jin Long announces to the students that today marks the moment they step into the realm of the inner world. The system will unveil their destined class, be it a formidable swordsman, a resilient knight, an agile assassin, or a potent mage. Destiny takes the reins. Principal Shui, confident that each of them will excel in their respective classes, activates the transfer formation, a vibrant blue circle encompassing all the students. Amidst the crowd stands our protagonist Chao Yu, revealing that after 18 years of reincarnation, the awaited day has arrived. He discloses the world's name, Kaiji Star, a parallel realm closely mirroring Earth. Unlike Earth, an artificial inner world's sudden emergence disrupted the human world, challenging dungeons surface globally, and at 18, individuals like Chao gain abilities through the transfer formation to tackle these dungeons. Killing monsters earns them experience and attribute points, enhancing their strength. Chao finds himself in an intriguing place as the system welcomes him, proposing the option to roll for his class. Hopeful, he inwardly prays for a favorable outcome. During the class roll, a colossal skull enveloped in a green aura materializes around Chao. The system hailed his achievement in unlocking the concealed class Necromancer. Chao's elation soared deeming it absolutely fantastic since a necromancer is an exceedingly rare class obtainable by only one or two individuals worldwide. With a mere wave of his staff, an abundance of top-notch undead creatures could be summoned from the gates of hell. Armed with sufficient mana, he could transform into a formidable one-man army. Generally, acquiring a hidden class meant wielding more power than the average player. Opting to assess his attributes initially, Chao perused the system's display revealing his name as Chao Yu, class as a necromancer, realm as an apprentice, and stats distributed as follows. 10 in strength, 6 in defense, 9 in agility, 0 in spirit, 10 in mana, and 10 in health. Gazing at his stats, he shook his head in disbelief, flabbergasted at the glaring absence of points in the spirit category. Utterly perplexed, he questioned, a necromancer with a spirit stat of 0. Dropping to his knees, he lamented the randomness of the initial attribute point distribution, emphasizing that spirit was paramount for a mage. With a spirit below five, he pondered how he could effectively engage in combat. In desperation, the system presented an option to roll for a talent. Tearfully, he consented, resigned to his seemingly bleak fate. He voiced the futility of even obtaining an S-grade talent if his spirit remained at zero. As the talent rolled, a magnificent aura enveloped him, and the system extended congratulations for acquiring an unknown grade talent dubbed the Brave Heart of a Mage. This talent boasted a passive effect, rewarding him with attribute points upon defeating enemies through physical attacks. Its active effect boasts a distinctive impact, elevating his other attribute values to match a specified attribute. The catch is that only one attribute can be bound before triggering the active effect. After perusing the system's message, he's taken aback, questioning if he misread it. He notes that acquiring free attribute points is nearly unheard of, considering you typically only gain them when you level up. Apart from that, the usual route to boosting attributes is through rigorous training. With this passive ability, though, he can accumulate attribute points simply by dispatching foes with physical attacks. Despite the one-time use limitation for the active effect, it can elevate his other attributes to match the highest one. If he employs it now, he could morph into an all-rounder, distributing points evenly across all attributes. Imagine a novice with a perfect 10 in every attribute, a historical powerhouse in the making. Internally, he contemplates waiting until his strength hits 1,000 or even 1,000,000, envisioning invincibility. Picture a necromancer boasting 1,000,000 points in each attribute, truly a formidable one-man army. Grinning, he emphasizes that his passive necessitates physical attacks, quipping, isn't strength the most crucial? With resolute determination, he instructs the system to allocate all his attribute points to strength. 
The system congratulates him on the successful distribution, now soaring with a strength of 20. He declares the next step is to register and complete the beginner task, as only then will obtaining a class be deemed a success. Suddenly, he's whisked away to the starting quest, finding himself in front of a portal with a stunning elf named Elaine welcoming him. Admiring her beauty, he couldn't help but ponder if she's just an NPC. Politely, he mentioned his intent to register for the beginner task, and Elaine gladly assisted, handing him his starter gift. The system chimed in, congratulating him on acquiring beginner gear, an old robe, a beginner staff, and a skill book for summoning skeletons. Surveying his new drip, he remarked that the robe seemed more like an accessory, dismissing the book due to his lack of spirit. However, the staff, boasting 20 points of strength, garnered his enthusiasm for its potential in combat. Curious about the task, he asked Elaine, who, with a smile, instructed him to escape from the misty cave. Unbeknownst to her, he had already left, and Elaine continued, cautioning against killing skeleton soldiers. As she spoke, he passed through the portal into a bone-filled cave, momentarily wondering if the NPC had something more to say. Brushing it off, he assumed the beginner task wouldn't be too challenging, but questioned the abundance of skulls. Suddenly a skeleton stirred, brandishing a knife. Swiftly turning, our protagonist identified it as a level one normal skeleton with 20 health and one agility. Gripping his staff firmly, Chow poised to strike the small opponent. With a single blow, the skeleton shattered, leaving him astonished at his strength. He noted the challenge of not using magic and earned an attribute point and three experience points for defeating the skeleton soldier. The system congratulated him on a one-shot kill and promised an A-grade passive skill, Miracle of Night, converting each strength point into two attack points. Chow found this stroke of luck incredible, realizing that strength influenced damage output, while defense determined damage reduction. Determined, he affirmed that one point in strength equals one point in attack power. Continuing his task, Chow faced a sudden onslaught of skeletons emerging from the ground. Despite the eerie scene, he remained focused. With a single swing of his staff, he obliterated the approaching skeletons, earning four attribute points and twelve experience points. As he leveled up, Chow reflected on the four attribute points gained from defeating the skeleton soldiers. Pushing his strength to a formidable thirty points, for an average newcomer, Achieving a whopping 10 points in a single attribute is considered genius. He pondered if this would make it too simple for them to grind these skeleton soldiers. Out of the blue, a green aura began forming a creature, and lo and behold, a skeleton captain emerged, boasting level 3, 50 health, 15 strength, 20 defense, and 1 agility. He was taken aback by its formidable strength, realizing a single hit from this monster could spell his doom. Fortunately, it only had one agility, so victory was his if he made the first move. And that's precisely what he did, dashing towards it and swinging his weapon. The skeleton captain deftly blocked his attack and retaliated. Chow narrowly dodged, mentally labeling it a bastard for attacking while defending, and witnessed it slamming the ground effortlessly. Spotting a gap in the monster's defenses, he exploited the opportunity, striking its stomach and sending it to the floor. Leaping in the air, he unleashed an attack, challenging the skeleton to block this. With a resounding ass-kicking, he dealt 50 damage, triumphing over the skeleton captain through physical prowess. He reaped the rewards of 10 EXP and 3 attribute points. What a challenging encounter, he mused after the defeat, questioning how others managed this beginner task. A golden orb materialized beside him, sparking curiosity about his impending reward. As it opened, the system revealed he gained the Skeleton Fist Set, a D-grade disposable item guaranteed to inflict critical damage when used. Despite the effectiveness, he couldn't help but feel a tad disappointed, wishing it were a permanent item. Abruptly, more skeletons materialized behind him. He swiftly pivoted, preparing for battle as their numbers surged. Despite being at level 2, his health remained a meager 20 points, necessitating caution to avoid accidental hits. Agilely, 
he maneuvered through the throng of skeleton soldiers, vanquishing them and gaining 20 experience points along with 10 attribute points. He remarked on the skeleton's low agility, relieved at their lack of speed. Upon leveling up, he checked his attributes. Chao Yu, Necromancer, Apprentice Level 4, Strength 46, Defense 6, Agility 9, Spirit 0, Mana 30, Experience 20. His talent, the brave heart of a mage, was of an unknown grade and his skill, Miracle Might, boasted an A-grade rating. Meanwhile, outside the school, students completed their beginner quests. One guy queried his friend about their class, receiving the response, Warrior Class, with pride for ancestral approval. As everyone exited, curiosity arose about the principal's silence. A student speculated, could someone still be inside? Another dismissed the idea, questioning the difficulty of such a simple task. Amid laughter, they discussed the perceived slowness of the skeleton soldiers and expressed disbelief that anyone could fail inside. A figure, visibly anxious, paced back and forth, questioning why Chow hadn't emerged yet, convinced that nothing could have happened to him. Meanwhile, Chow pondered if all the skeletons had been defeated, growing puzzled at the absence of a task completion notification. Abruptly, a menacing voice boomed. How dare you! Chiao's expression turned serious as the skeletons levitated toward a focal point. Skulls merged, unleashing a colossal aura, forming a three-headed giant skeleton monster. A powerful scream echoed, and the system alerted Chao that this creature was the Skeleton King, boasting 400 health, 45 strength and 60 defense, along with skills named Bone Pierce and Bone Explosion. Confused and shocked, Chao questioned the presence of a boss in a beginner task, wondering if they intended for all beginners to face such peril. The Skeleton King raised its weapon high, preparing a devastating blow toward our protagonist. Fortunately, with agility, Chao skillfully evaded the creature's attack. Internally, he acknowledged his luck in dodging it, realizing the potential fatality had it connected. Although the opponent showcased strength, its lack of agility proved to be Chao's only advantage. With a defense reaching 60, uncertainty loomed over whether his power could penetrate it. Opting for action over contemplation, he successfully struck the king, yielding a modest 32 damage. To secure victory, approximately 10 more successful attacks seemed necessary. Executing five more swift strikes, Chao pondered if the intimidating appearance belied an easily defeated foe. However, with 200 GP remaining, the battle persisted. Suddenly, Chao's eyes widened as the king menacingly declared its long-standing guardianship of the Misty Cave. Despite losing some skeleton soldiers, the audacity of a newcomer breaching its defense perplexed the king. Resolute, it proclaimed Chao wouldn't leave alive. Unfazed, Chao remarked on the creature's apparent strength, prompting a lunge. Notably, the monster's increased speed caught Chao's attention. Swinging its colossal sword with earth-shattering force, the strike shattered the ground. Fortunately, Chao adeptly dodged it, recognizing the need to restrain the monster's movements to survive. Undeterred, the creature rushed anew, prompting Chao to observe an impending boulder collapse behind it. The monstrous entity struck once more in Chao's direction, yet he skillfully evaded the attack. Now squarely facing the creature, he daringly goaded it. Come at me, you colossal blockhead! The monster swung its sword again, prompting Chao to opt for blocking instead of dodging. However, the overwhelming power of the king was too much, sending Chao hurtling towards a wall. Internally, he noted that the hit merely grazed him, yet his HP dwindled to four. Undeterred, the king pressed on with its assault. Chao, realizing he couldn't afford another hit, deftly dodged the oncoming attack. The monster's strike was potent enough to damage parts of the cave, causing debris to fall and deal 70 points of damage. Its HP now stood at 129 out of 500. Feeling the urgency, Chao knew he had to end the fight swiftly before the king could recover. With a leap into the air, he declared his intent to finish the battle in one strike. Choosing to utilize his skeleton boxing glove, a degrade item guaranteeing a critical hit, Chao directed a determined punch towards the trapped skeleton king. 
The blow dealt a devastating 132 damage. The system promptly acknowledged his accomplishment, congratulating him on completing the beginner's quest and officially becoming one of the other world's players. A portal materialized as the system lauded him for vanquishing the Cave Mist's boss, the Skeleton King, for the first time, granting him 30 free stat points. Recognizing that he defeated the boss through a melee fight, Chao received an additional 10 stat points and 50 EXP points. The system awarded him a three-level increase for his first kill, elevating him to level five. As a final reward for his triumph, he received the Ring of the Skeleton King, a C-rank item. Shocked at the acquisition of boss equipment, he learned that the ring enhanced the user's first normal attack, increasing its damage by 50% with a cooldown of 24 hours. With a grin, he mentions that, while it might not measure up to the robustness of the skeleton boxing gloves, its key perk lies in its reusability. If he were to sell a C-rank equipment, its value could easily reach a few hundred thousand. It seems he's struck gold this time. Yet pondering the system's reference to the first kill, he questions if nobody had slain the Skeleton King before. If so, how did they all pass the trial, he wonders. Brushing off the thought, he announces his departure, exiting the tutorial with a rather formidable status window. Returning to school, his friend spots him and rushes over for a hug. Taken aback, Chao questions Yang Xiangdi about the unexpected embrace. Yang, concerned, asks why it took him so long for a beginner's mission, fearing he might have met his end in there. Surprised, Chao inquires if everyone else swiftly completed the beginner's mission. Yang confirms, revealing that three hours have passed since the last person emerged. Curious, Chao asks about Yang's role, learning he drew the mage class. When Chao questions the concept of a mage, Yang playfully responds with abracadabra. Puzzled, Chao wonders if they shared the same beginner's world. Their conversation is abruptly interrupted by a blonde guy calling out Chao for being the last one to exit. With a laugh, Blondie asserts that Chao is nothing more than an embroidered pillow, emphasizing that talent reigns supreme in this other world, not just looks. Blondie is named Ma Fei, taunts Chao, asking if he wants to know his role. Chao, not particularly fond of Blondie, shoots him an annoyed look, silently questioning why Ma Fei enjoys picking on him. Out of the blue, the principal announces that everyone is already enrolled in the other world, and the entire class will embark on beginner's training tomorrow. He suggests introducing their roles and talents to foster better acquaintance. A shout rings out as someone proudly declares themselves a soldier with a D-rank talent. Following suit, Another classmate reveals they are an assassin. Another expressed concern about their F-rank talent and feeling a bit doomed. A girl with healthy melons introduces herself as a mage and healer, playfully named Zhao Ziyue. Another girl steps forward, claiming the role of a meat shield with a solid B-rank talent, her name Zhuo Yu. Ma Fei chimes in, identifying himself as a swordsman with a B-rank talent. The supporting characters express awe, deeming Fei blessed by the heavens for landing an exceptionally powerful role in the other world. I don't understand the hype around being a swordsman. It's the most basic class in all video games and anime. Anyway, let's get back to the story. The principal silently reflects that an individual with a B-rank talent is already considered among the ranks of geniuses. It seems this group of students isn't too shabby. Then it's Chiao's turn. He mentions he's a necromancer, but deems it inconvenient to unveil his talent now, thinking, who knows what it is? He doesn't even know himself. The principal is astonished, exclaiming, a necromancer is a hidden role. The students are startled by the principal's words, recalling a necromancer who once single-handedly wiped out another union on his own. Marfei ponders how that's possible, stating that even if it's a hidden role, mages are notoriously fragile especially fearing close encounters. He notes that necromancers are even weaker than regular folks due to years of contact with the undead, taking an exceptionally long time to cast summoning spells, practically lacking teammates for protection. Assassins, swordsmen, and similarly attack-focused roles become the necromancer's best allies. 
Acknowledging that Chow didn't disclose his talent's rank, Ma Fei suspects it's because the rank is embarrassingly low. Suddenly a guy praises Chow for not being arrogant or irritable, wondering if this is the demeanor of a genius. How cool! He believes Chow, with a hidden role, remains modest, a quality unattainable for ordinary people. Another guy remarks on the difference between a genius like Chow and themselves, emphasizing Chow's down-to-earth personality. He admits that if he had a hidden role, he wouldn't be as composed as Chow. Despite the glazing being crazy, Chow asserts that a necromancer unable to cast a single spell is only marginally stronger than an average person. He's uncertain if he can even protect himself in beginner's training, so making a fuss over this seems unwarranted. He pondered over what steps to take, fearing the tough times ahead when his peers discover his inability to summon even a single undead creature. The principal silently cheered, Chow, you've made it! Promising that once he completes the beginner's training, he'll secure a spot in the nation's top university. After everyone introduced themselves, the principal gathered the students, declaring the class concluded for the day. As everyone dispersed, Yang praised Chao as truly awesome, expressing jealousy for not landing the necromancer role. Yang chimed in, noting his eight points of vigor and decent stats, wondering if that talent wasn't too shabby. Chao, with a spirit stat of zero, assured him that hard work could compensate for clumsiness, privately remarking on Yang's single-digit stats. Having 76 stat points makes me a god-level being, right? He pondered inwardly. Returning home, Chao opened the door and declared, I'm home. Reflecting that this was the house his parents left behind, he'd maintained the tradition after they mysteriously vanished when he was six. His parents, kind souls, left for the capital to fetch milk, disappearing without a trace, leaving him an orphan. Twelve years later, he still wondered where they went. He needs to secure a spot at the capital's university and uncover the truth behind it all. The following day, with all the students gathered in front of the principal, the principal issues a request for the day's beginner's training. If anyone feels incapable, they're urged to step back immediately. Failing the training is preferable to risking one's life during it. The principal reassures them that, generally, beginner's worlds aren't too perilous and won't result in player deaths. However, he mentions an exception, a past incident where a nightmare village wiped out an entire class of 40, leaving no trace. To this day, the nature of that ominous beginner's world remains a mystery, known only by its chilling name, Nightmare Village. The revelation startles the students, but the principal reassures them, emphasizing that there's no need for solemnity. As long as they exit the other world in time, they'll be safe. Ready for action, he urges them. And as the stopwatch hits zero, it's time to plunge into the other world. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero inches. The beginner's training kicks off. Every student is whisked away to the other world, materializing in a village. Some speculate if this is the world they must conquer, while others find the surroundings eerie. Calming his classmates, Ma Fei assures them that he'll unquestionably safeguard them. With determination, he urges them to follow him, promising to lead them to success. Sporting a grin, Ma Fei shoots Chao a sidelong glance, inwardly challenging Chao's identity as a necromancer. He vows to demonstrate that he, Ma Fei, is the most fitting to be the strongest in the class. Internally, Chao finds the situation peculiar, pondering the nature of this beginner's world and the absence of system prompts. Suddenly, a Thanos-like figure enters, expressing regret in a comment delivered by an elderly man with purple skin. Ma Fei inquires if the man is an NPC, while Chao seeks clarification on his words. Purple-skinned, the man welcomes them to the Nightmare Village with a serious tone, revealing that they are in the beginner's training Nightmare Village, an S-rank world. The system explains that the beginner's training difficulty is distinct, equating a beginner's S-rank to a normal world's E-rank. Their task is to survive and uncover the secret at the core of Nightmare Village. The revelation leaves the students stunned, realizing they are in the village that claimed the lives of 40 individuals, a place no one has conquered before. 
Some folks grew quite frightened, attempting to retreat and opting out of the game. Witnessing the pandemonium, Marfei assured everyone not to fret, asserting he'd lead them out of Nightmare Village. Internally, Chao pondered the necessity of at least an early stage level in an E-level world for survival, considering they were all disciples. Contemplating the challenges ahead, he wondered how they, as disciples, could navigate this. Chao elucidated the hierarchical levels in the other world, spanning disciples early stage, middle stage and late stage, king and godly. Disciples ranged from level 1 to 10, early stage from 11 to 20 and so forth. An attempt to escape by one man hit a barrier, bouncing him back, leaving the group puzzled. Purple intervened, advising them to cease struggling, revealing that once they entered Nightmare Village, departure was impossible. Shocked, the realization of their predicament set in with thoughts of imminent doom. Expressing concerns about his affluent family, one man voiced his reluctance to meet an untimely demise. Marfei rallied everyone, assuring them of his commitment to leading them out of the village. Internally, Chao emphasized the mission's objective, uncovering the secret at the core of Nightmare Village. Though enigmatic, Purple seemed non-malevolent to Chao, suggesting he might not be their enemy. Purple reassured the group, inviting them to make themselves comfortable. Ma Fei sought clarification, asking if Purple meant they should face their predicament confidently. With a somber tone, Purple clarified that acceptance of their fate was the key, implying that death within the village was inevitable. The children were left in stunned silence after those words. The violet figure, introducing himself as the leader of Nightmare Village, Wogan, declared he'd cease his attempts with them. Wogan outlined two conditions for dwelling in Nightmare Village. One, they could inhabit any vacant house but must avoid touching the black stones on the doors. And two, they had to return home before nightfall, securing windows and doors without opening them under any circumstances. Chao, a mix of confusion and curiosity, questioned why they couldn't venture out after dark. Wogan cryptically replied they'd comprehend once night fell. As darkness enveloped, everyone followed the village head's advice, forming four groups of eleven, each selecting a house and sealing themselves inside. The protagonist's group chose a house, and a girl suggested they rest on the second floor for safety. Approaching Chao, Zi Yue playfully reminded him to protect her if danger arose. With a wink and a mention of her healthy melons, she teased her healing abilities, claiming she could provide ample HP. Suddenly, Zuo Yu called out Ziyue, questioning her shameless behavior in front of their classmates. Ziyue fired back, asserting it wasn't Zuo Yu's concern if she was fine with it. Zuo Yu retorted, comparing Ziyue's chest to a cow's udders without intending a Western insult. Ziyue fired back, asserting that having something is always better than having nothing at all. In response, an angered Zuo Yu resorted to calling her overweight. Meanwhile, a peripheral character stood near a window, gazing outside. Suddenly, the man began to weep, calling out, Granny, I miss you. Outside the window, he perceived his grandmother's apparition beckoning to him. She mentioned feeling cold and frightened, urging him to open the window and embrace her. Without hesitation, the man pledged to do so. Chao, witnessing the scene, frantically warned him that it wasn't his grandmother. Regrettably, it was too late. The window was already ajar. The granny's countenance transformed into a menacing visage as she lunged toward the man. Just in the nick of time, someone wielded a golden staff and employed the skill sandbinding to restrain the granny. Fatty, the savior, urged the man to hurry, explaining he couldn't maintain the binding for long. The man fled to safety as the granny morphed into a red ghostly figure, escaping the sandbinding. This monstrous entity, known as Nightmare, is a level 3 foe, with 50 GP, 25 strength, 5 defense, and 25 agility, and its unique talent is enchantment. Panic ensued among the kids as they questioned how such a perverse monster could exist in a beginner's S-ranked world. Abruptly, the terror charged toward Fatty, who in turn became frightened, vociferating at the monster, warning it that consuming him would lead to high blood pressure elevated blood sugar, and a concentrated surge of fat in the blood. 
Just as the monster neared Fatty, a protective barrier thwarted its assault. Zuo Yu generated the barrier, instructing Fatty to retreat. Despite shielding against the monster's attack, Zuo Yu incurred damage and called on Ziyue to administer healing. Subsequently, she tasked Chao with summoning the undead to subdue the nightmare, to which they both assented. Ziyue invoked her healing magic, enveloping the area in a green aura that commenced mending Zuo Yu. Confident, Zuo Yu inwardly asserted that, with everyone collaborating, confronting the surging nightmare shouldn't pose a challenge. The objective now was to stall until Chao could summon an undead. However, her countenance shifted to astonishment when Chao sprinted past her, leaping into the air, poised to strike the monster with his staff. Fatty urgently shouted at Chao, advising him that's not how to use a staff, and cautioning that proximity to the nightmare would be fatal. Despite the warning, Chao landed a decisive blow, dealing 50 damage and vanquishing the monster. The onlookers were left dumbfounded, a blonde girl remarking on the instant demise of a monster with 50 HP. A nearby boy inquired whether all necromancers fought in such a manner. Attention then pivoted to an object that materialized where the monster had perished. Chao explained that the slain nightmare had transformed into a black stone, dissolving upon its demise. Zhuo Yu points out that the symbol on this object matches the one on the doorframe. Ziyue adds that both are from Nightmare Village, so it adds up. Internally, Chao finds the situation peculiar, wondering if there's a glitch since he didn't receive any stat points despite melee killing a nightmare. When Zhuo Yu asks if he noticed anything, Chao claims he observed nothing, possibly overthinking it. The following day, side characters express gratitude to Zhuo and Chao for their actions the previous night. Someone mentions the lingering fear from that monster, while another praises Chao's quick takedown. A girl highlights Zhuo Yu using her shield to block the nightmare's attack. Internally, Ma Fei thinks he wouldn't let Zhuo Yu take the hit and deems it unmanly to hide behind a girl. With confidence, he declares he can defeat a nightmare with a single strike. Chao notices Ma Fei's morning training and commends his dedication. Fatty jokes about the class monitor's progress. Ma Fei composes himself, pretending to cough, and invites Zhuo Yu to stay in a house with him, promising she won't have to tank any damage. Zhuo Yu clarified her role as a tank, emphasizing that if she doesn't absorb damage, he shouldn't expect to take on that responsibility. He responded, claiming he could handle a knight solo and didn't need her help. Zuo Yu disagreed, reminding him that teamwork is essential, as their teacher already mentioned. She suggested learning from Chao's cooperative approach. Kill them all, echoed through the air, capturing the kid's attention. These words emanated from the purple-clad villagers of the night village. Their directive was clear, ensure none escape, bind the children to a pyre, and let the flames cleanse their sins. The village chief fervently shouted to eliminate any resistance. Ma Fei questioned the village head about the situation, asking if there was a misunderstanding. The chief responded with skepticism, questioning if they were trying to play dumb. Internally, Chao noted the similarities between the village people and their class, emphasizing the lack of significant number differences. Ma Fei probed further asking if the chief referred to them killing a nightmare the previous night. The chief silenced him, explaining that the entities were protector spirits of Nightmare Village. According to him, the group had violated village rules, prompting the protector spirits to administer punishment. He asserted that the angered protector spirits would bring suffering to the villagers alongside them. Claiming their sin deserved a thousand deaths, Ma Fei inquired if there was a way to save a protector spirit accidentally killed. The chief responded with a confident, Ha, there is, he continues, asserting that the individual who has stirred the wrath of the protector spirits must remain outside the residence as night descends. He inquires who among them possesses such courage. Internally, Ma Fei reflects that the true extent of the nightmares in Nightmare Village is unknown and the night could conceal even graver perils. Staying outside seems perilous. 
Abruptly, Chow declares that he vanquished the Knight or Protector Spirit, using either term interchangeably. He states his intent to await the Nightfall here. Turning to Chow, Ma Fei questions if he has lost his sanity, as seeking death by staying outside is reckless. Addressing the Chief, Chow apologizes, attributing it to his classmate's sluggishness and advises not to heed his words. Chow reassures them, asserting he hasn't lost his mind and has something to verify that might aid their escape from this world. All right, chain this brat up, the old man orders. A short while later, Chow finds himself chained to a cross. Ma Fei queries what he meant about helping them leave this world, while Zuo Yu wonders if he uncovered Nightmare Village's core secret. Chow responds that he might have and plans to test it tonight. As the night arrives, Chow stands alone in the eerie fog. Suddenly, a grotesque figure materializes, traversing a house roof with five eyes moving spider-like. The monstrous entity charged at our captive hero, but in a twist of fate, Chow flashed a sly grin as a sand-binding spell ensnared the nightmare. The magical intervention came from none other than Fatty, who urged Ma Fei to act swiftly, cautioning that his control over the creature was fleeting. With determination, Ma Fei darted toward the menacing beast, reassuring Fatty that he would safeguard them all from the threat. He asserted that, as a true swordsman, one person armed with a blade could overcome any adversary in the world. Confidence wavered momentarily as a lightning-fast punch came at him, but he skillfully blocked the attack. So fast, he thought inwardly, pondering how Chow, a mere mage, had dealt with a similar menace. Undeterred, Ma Fei pressed on, executing a defensive breaking strike that unfortunately only inflicted a meager five damage. Ziwei and Zuo Yu approached Chao, prompting him to question why they had all ventured out. Zuo Yu explained that they feared for his safety and couldn't let him face the danger alone, so they joined the fray. Attempting to release him from the chains, Zuo Yu faced an obstacle. She suggested enlisting Ma Fei's sword to break the chains but with him unable to reach them, they pondered their next move. Suddenly, the chains shattered effortlessly, leaving Chiao to reveal that he could free himself. The girls, astounded by his strength, questioned if he was truly a necromancer. Meanwhile, Ma Fei continued his fierce battle with the monster. Observing his struggles, Duo Yu called out his name and assured him of their imminent assistance. She urged Ziyue to provide healing to Ma Fei. Although Ziwei was ready to heal him, Ma Fei insisted he didn't need assistance or healing, emphasizing that true heroes are forged through battles and scars are badges of pride. Fatty suggested Ma Fei not face the monster alone, but he countered by advising them to target the creature's weak point, its head. Zhou Yu agreed, recalling how Chao had defeated a nightmare by hitting its head with a staff the day before. With a confident smile, Ma Fei admitted he should have considered this strategy earlier. However, Chao intervened, stating that the real weak point of a nightmare isn't its head. Unfazed, Ma Fei dismissed Chao's words, insinuating that Chao was merely afraid he would surpass him. He asserted that while Chao needed help against a nightmare, he only required his sword. Lifting his sword, he invited Chao to watch his next strike closely because it would be remarkably impressive. After slashing the monster, Ma Fei was surprised by the outcome. Despite aiming for the head, the creature didn't fall with a single strike. He questioned Fatty about the accuracy of the nightmare's weak point, wondering if he was deliberately stalling. Zhuo Yu and Fatty defended Chao's success against a nightmare, suggesting the issue might lie with Ma Fei's skills compared to Chao's. This revelation shattered Ma Fei's self-esteem, as he couldn't accept being considered inferior to a necromancer when he prided himself as a skilled swordsman. Zhuo Yu urgently called out for him to return, cautioning that given his current HP, another hit would be fatal. She suggested letting Chao handle it instead. Suddenly, a cerulean aura enveloped Ma Fei as he executed his defense-breaking strike swiftly dealing 30 damage to the monster. With a mere 5 GP left, Ma Fei resolved to vanquish the nightmare, determined to prove himself on par with Chao. 
In an unexpected twist, Chow landed the final blow, defeating the monster. Ma Fei, taken aback and angered, accused Chow of stealing his kill. Despite Chow's congratulations and acknowledgement of his effort, Ma Fei continued to protest, insisting that he soloed the nightmare, with Fatty advising him to let it go. As two more nightmares approached, Chow swiftly directed them into the house, suggesting there was no need to face these foes and expressing confidence in knowing a way to pass. Inside, Zhuo Yu inquired about the plan, to which Chow responded that they would find out tomorrow and urged them to trust him. The next day, the village chief and other villagers confronted the kids, labeling them despicable outsiders. The chief accused them of squandering the chance for redemption by slaying another protector spirit, declaring they should all go to hell. He declares that regardless of today's discussions, a dire fate awaits them, and they must safeguard their nightmare village. Chao, addressing the village chief by name, questions if they truly belong to Nightmare Village. The chief asserts their generations-long residency and warns against futile attempts to delay the inevitable. Chao, sensing a pivotal moment, resolves to unveil the truth behind Nightmare Village. Staring intently, he asserts a singular truth, prompting the chief to inquire further. Chao gestures towards them, affirming that none among them originally belonged to Nightmare Village. Adopting a solemn demeanor, he discloses that all 40 are remnants of the class previously eradicated in Nightmare Village. Chow details their entrapment in a fantasy realm since their arrival, leaving them stranded with no means of escape. In response, the chief erupts in laughter, dismissing the notion of a fantasy realm and the existence of a wiped-out class. He accuses Chow and his companions of concocting tales fueled by fear, deeming them mere fabrications with no supporting evidence. Unfazed, Chow grins and produces a stone as proof. Incensed, the chief identifies it as the protector stone and condemns Chow to 10,000 deaths for its removal. Ma Fei intervenes, revealing that all of them possess such stones. The chief's eyes widen as he realizes these protector stones are revered high-level holy objects, offering nighttime protection. He warns of divine consequences for tampering, setting the stage for a tense confrontation. Chow asserted that by shattering the black stones, fissures would manifest in the fantasy realm. Following his words, everyone tossed their stones to the ground, causing them to fracture. True to Chow's prediction, the sky began to fragment, capturing the attention of all villagers. Abruptly, the chief clutched his head, seemingly in agony, as memories unfolded. In his recollections, he assured the principal that if they collaborated, they could safely bring everyone back after completing the beginner's training. Among his classmates in the memories, one expressed a desire to attend Kyoto University, while another aspired to enter Huaqing University, one of China's premier institutions, aiming to become a top mage. However, upon entering the other world, they found themselves in Nightmare Village, prompting them to question the nature of this unfamiliar world. A shadowy figure emerged, casting a purple, ominous hue across the darkened sky. Panic ensued among the people, culminating in a transformation into Lil Thanos's. This marked the loss of their memories, their transformation into Nightmare Village residents, and the chief's assumption of leadership. Yet he now recalls everyone and recognizes his role as their class monitor. Out of the blue, a system notification flashed, announcing a player's discovery of Nightmare Village's core secret and the successful awakening of its villagers and rewards would be distributed based on individual ratings. A wave of cheers erupted among everyone, celebrating their passage. The system declared it was transporting all players out of the world, initiating the return process for each student. The monitor, who was the village chief, expressed gratitude for their assistance. Fatty complimented Chow, curious about how he knew the right approach. Chow suggested discussing it later at home. As everyone vanished, an unexpected twist unfolded. Ma Fei, Fatty Chow, Ziyue and Zuo Yu found themselves still present. A notification congratulated the five players on destroying the Black Nightmare Stones, introducing a new mission to retrieve the Heart of Nightmares. 
the mission's difficulty was labelled F-Rank, returning to the fourth campus in reality. The principal was astounded that everyone successfully navigated the nightmare village. Yet Chao and a few others hadn't returned. Internally, he pondered how this could be and considered the possibility of them triggering a concealed mission. If that were true and they completed it, they'd have the chance to choose any university in the country solely based on that accomplishment. However, embarking on a hidden mission is typically perilous, especially considering it's the Nightmare Village's hidden mission. Being newcomers, they might not be sufficiently robust to tackle it. Back in the Nightmare Village, Zi Yue questioned their next move. Acknowledging her level 3 status and the overall weakness of the group, she argued that delving into a hidden mission would be suicidal. Moreover, they lacked information about the heart of nightmares and where to locate it. Xiu Yu proposed the idea that perhaps awakening the village head and others was the only necessity, questioning the need to break the black stones initially. Suddenly, Fatty chimed in, asserting his knowledge that hidden missions in this world are opportunities stumbled upon rather than sought. He suggested that Chao might have known from the start that breaking the black stones would activate a hidden world, intentionally involving them in the process. Holding on to Chao, Fatty addressed him as Big Brother and explained that he didn't use that term lightly. He revealed that he didn't embark on the hidden mission alone and was willing to bring them along to seize the opportunity together. Even though Chao hadn't considered all of that, Ma Fei internally remarks that he didn't expect Chao to be willing to share this kind of opportunity. However, he asks him to hold on. While he might not have matched up to Chao in the newbie training, Ma Fei is confident he'll make a significant contribution to this hidden mission. Suddenly, a horde of nightmares rushes towards our heroes, yelling, They must all die! Fatty curses, noting that four of them came at once, and he wonders how they're supposed to defeat these monsters. The battle kicks off. Fatty binds one with sand. Zuo Yu bravely tanks an attack, and Zi Wei heals her. Meanwhile, Ma Fei uses his defense breaking strike on one, dealing a meager 10 damage. Ma Fei is surprised, wondering why he only dealt 10 points of damage when Chao one shotted one. Zi Wei urges them to hurry as her mana is running low, and Zuo Yu's HP is almost depleted. Suddenly, Chao eliminates the nightmare attacking the girls. Two more nightmares rush towards him, and with swift movements, Chao defeats them, earning 30 experience points and extra stat points in melee. A golden orb appears, and Chao remarks, as expected of a hidden world, it gives high rewards. He obtains a necklace called Little Fairies, an F-rank item that increases skill damage by 5%, suitable for mages. Chao, unable to unleash any skills, decides to give it to Fatty. After Ma Fei deals with the nightmare attacking him, the monsters are all defeated, thanks to everyone working together. Ma Fei suggests they all must have noticed the awesomeness in him as well. Chao then encourages them to keep hunting nightmares with a grin, thinking he just needs one more kill to level up to six, and increase his chances of snagging some quality gear. Fatty recalls the hidden mission involving retrieving the heart of nightmares. Chao figures it must be on a nightmare, so he urges them to follow. However, his misstep leads them to a crumbling ground and they all fall through. Landing, Chao wonders about the soft ground until he realizes he's on top of Fatty's ass, who asks him to get off. As they regain their footing, Chao checks if everyone's okay. Zhuo Yu assures they are, but Fatty notices a strong smell. Zuo explains it's the lack of ventilation causing the stench of decomposing animals. Siyue, with a nervous expression, insists something's wrong and points to a giant nightmare. The system identifies it as the Nightmare King, a level 10 boss with 1,000 GP, 65 strength, 20 defense, and 60 agility. The system gently reminds them awakening the wrath of the Nightmare King, causing nervousness as everyone ponders whether the heart of nightmares is the Nightmare King's heart. Zuo Yu contemplates seeking a way to abort this hidden mission. Observing its 65 attack stats, she asserts that it would turn her and her shield into minced meat in no time. Ma Fei, taking her word, decides to let the Nightmare King off the hook for now. 
Bro's trying to play it cool, but deep down, he knows he'd be terrified if it attacked him. To their astonishment, Chow mentions a chance, silently noting his 101 strength and the miraculous muscle power, totaling 202 attacks. With a 50% boost from the Ring of the Skeleton King, his first hit could wipe out one-third of the Nightmare King's HP. Yet attacking its weak points three or four times poses a perilous plan. One misstep, and the Nightmare King could end him. Suddenly, Fatty places his hand on Chow's forehead, questioning if he has a fever for suggesting they stand a chance against the ten-meter-tall monster. Chow insists that although the Nightmare King's stats are high, its glaring weakness is defense, offering a slim chance of victory by exploiting their strengths against its vulnerabilities. Zuo Yu chimed in, expressing her understanding of Chow's plan. He then inquired if they should divert the Nightmare King's attention. Chow affirmed, emphasizing that with their collective assistance, he could seize the opportunity to strike and assured them of his ability to take it down. The peril, however, was evident. The Nightmare King's agility surpassed theirs, and Chow feared a single hit could prove fatal. Acknowledging the risk, they agreed to collaborate, entrusting Chow with their support. Ma Fei agreed to play along, emphasizing that his life rested in Chow's hands. Cautioning against unnecessary bravado, Ma Fei advised Chow that fleeing from such a formidable boss wouldn't be shameful. Resting briefly to recharge, Chow contemplated that as long as they refrained from attacking the Nightmare King, it would remain dormant. Realizing the critical importance of the first strike, Chow aimed to identify the creature's weakest point. Observing something peculiar, he speculated that it must be the Nightmare King's vulnerability. Raising his staff high, the Skeleton King's ring activated, and with a mighty blow, Chow landed a critical hit, dealing 508 damage. Ma Fei and Fatty were astounded by the mage's formidable prowess. A notification appeared, revealing that Chow had shattered the heart of nightmares, altering the mission to an A-rank difficulty, now focused on killing the awakened Nightmare King. As the menacing creature stirred, Chow was sent back momentarily, instructing everyone to prepare and execute their plan. The Nightmare King, awakening with a menacing declaration, branded them as vile humans. The colossal Nightmare King loomed above them, dwarfing their figures. Chow swiftly contacted Ma Fei, instructing him to provoke the beast and draw its attention. Ma Fei sprinted towards the monster, dismissing Chow's caution, and unleashed a defense-breaking strike resulting in a meager one point of damage. Bewildered, he questioned how Chow managed to land a massive 508 damage hit with just one blow. Undeterred, Ma Fei declared he'd persist, even if his attacks felt like mere tickles. Persistently, he delivered multiple slashes, each dealing a paltry one or two damage. In response, the Nightmare King scornfully labeled Ma Fei a worm, questioning if he desired to be the first to perish. Unfazed, Ma Fei readied himself, boasting about his three-foot sword and past accomplishments, defiantly challenging death. Just as the monster struck Ma Fei, a sand-binding spell intercepted the attack, followed by a shield of light that saved him, albeit with a two-level power reduction. Ziyue desperately healed Ma Fei, who clung to life. Struggling to block the Nightmare King's assault, Ma Fei confessed his dwindling endurance and warned Chao that he might meet his end here. Undeterred, Chao lunged at the monster, landing a powerful blow that dealt 182 damage. The Nightmare King now had 336 health, triggering a system notification about its low health and the imminent activation of the Realm of Nightmares. The monster unleashed a deafening scream, causing AOE damage to our heroes. Internally, Chao resolved not to give the Nightmare King a chance, suspecting that Wogan and the others endured prolonged captivity due to this devastating attack. Rushing toward the menacing creature once more, Chao unleashed an attack that dealt 182 damage, bringing the Nightmare King's health down to 128. Just one more hit, and Chao could finish it off. Leaping into the air, he poised for the final strike. The girls cautioned him to be careful. Ziyue mentioned she had no more mana for healing. 
Undeterred, Chao reassured them and landed a powerful blow, dealing 128 damage. The system notification praised him for defeating the Nightmare Villager's boss, granting 30 free stat points. Notably, Chao's melee tactics earned him an additional 10 free stat points and 50 XP points. The system then revealed the completion of the hidden mission to kill the Nightmare King, promising rewards based on player ratings, evaluation and level. Everyone celebrated their success. Following the evaluation, Ziyue received a D-rank rating and the talent Spring Breeze and Willow. Zuo secured a C-rank rating with the same talent. Fatty earned a C-rank rating and the talent Ground Explosion Magic, while Marfei received a C-rank rating along with the talent Separating the World with One Strike. Chao achieved an impressive A-rank rating, earning 50 EXP and a B-rank skillbook titled Withering Magic. Chao quietly acknowledges that he can't currently utilize this skill, but at least the soul is still intact. He advises the Nightmare King to drop something substantial, and suddenly he acquires a dragon-piercing sword, an item of B-rank. It enhances attack by 100 points, disregards 30% of the opponent's armor, limited to fighters. Despite its merit, Chao deems it unfortunate, questioning why a B-rank sword dropped. Not pleased, he hands it over to Marfei, explaining that as a mage, he can't use it. Marfei is surprised, questioning why Chao would give him a B-rank sword so casually. Chao counters, asking if Marfei is the sole sword user, justifying his action. Marfei, realizing the value, mentions players struggling to buy such equipment. He suggests Chao could get a house in the capital by selling it. But Chao remains indifferent, urging Marfei to enjoy the sword. While inspecting the loot for another Nightmare King drop, Chao realizes only one item was obtained. Brushing it off, he internally notes he'll check his status window. Strength increased, but with a mere 70 GP, he acknowledges vulnerability. Endowed with the talent, the mage's brave heart, Chao faces the passive's constraint, preventing other stat increases. To ensure survival, he contemplates alternative strategies, staying on high alert. The hidden mission wraps up, signaling an imminent return to the real world. The system prompts players to prepare for the transition, and within moments they all found themselves back in the real world. Joy spread across everyone's faces upon their return. The principal hurried over, mentioning they had been absent for two days. Fearing they might never return, he inquired about the ordeal. After detailing their experience, the principal nodded knowingly, stating it was exactly as he suspected, a plunge into a hidden quest. He remarked on their luck for seeing top universities vying for them. The side characters marveled at their class producing five geniuses simultaneously sought after by prestigious universities. Internally, Marfei whispered to Chao to wait for the next otherworldly adventure, promising regret for giving him the dragon-piercing sword. Confident in the enhanced gear, he vowed to surpass Chao in the early stages of the level 11 realm. Suddenly, a suited man burst into the school, urgently calling the principal. He reported representatives from Hua Qing University and Jingdu University seeking the five geniuses. Internally, the principal marveled at the swift information and anticipated a satisfying end to his teaching career before retirement. Two men entered the school, exchanging pleasantries with the principal. They reminisced about the old days, with the principal addressing them as Teacher Peng and Teacher Pei, expressing how long it had been since they last met. Peng observed the five prodigies and remarked that they must be the exceptional students who conquered Nightmare Village and completed the covert mission, a truly remarkable feat. He greeted them, mentioning his role as a recruitment teacher at Jingdu University, emphasizing the school's urgent need for talents like them. Expressing willingness, he offered to dispatch acceptance letters the next day. Pei, however, questioned Peng's audacity in advocating for them without conducting any tests. Peng defended Jingdu's sincerity, but welcomed testing if it eased Pei's concerns. Pei then introduced himself as the recruitment teacher at Hua Qing University, 
assuring them that the test aimed to evaluate their roles, adaptability, and whether their various stats met the criteria for school admission. Internally, Chow mused, determining our abilities and roles, wouldn't I, who can't use my skills, be at a disadvantage? Despite this, he was determined to join Jingdu University to pursue leads related to his parents. When Peng asked who wanted to be tested first, Ma Fei, a swordsman disciple with a B-rank talent at level 5, volunteered for the initial examination. Mr. Peng was impressed that Ma Fei had reached level 5, despite having only completed the beginner's training. Additionally, Ma Fei possessed a B-rank talent, a rare occurrence. Mr. Peng remarked that prodigies like him don't appear often, describing him as good-looking and tall, not bad. Is my guy gay or something? Suddenly, Mr. Pei instructed Ma Fei to try hitting him. Ma Fei readied himself, cautioning him to be careful, and then unleashed his skill, the world-separating strike on Mr. Pei. Following the attack, Pei was shocked that Ma Fei could break his defense. Despite being a gunman disciple with defense not being his forte, Mr. Pei was still at level 25. It was a significant feat for Ma Fei to penetrate his defense. Acknowledging Ma Fei's achievement, Pei praised his rare shield-breaking technique, the world-separating strike. He suggested that if Ma Fei could enhance the attack power at the tip of his sword, it would be even more formidable. Grateful for the praise, Ma Fei thanked him. Mr. Peng chimed in, noting that even if Ma Fei's strength was concentrated in one area, his strength stat must be extremely high, likely at least 35. Considering the speed of his attacks, his agility seemed quite impressive too. The side characters were impressed by Ma Fei's remarkable 35 attack stat at only level 5, questioning if this was typical for a swordsman disciple. One person remarked that if he had drawn the swordsman role like Ma Fei, his deceased grandmother would have lived in luxury. However, Mr. Peng, inwardly displeased, felt that Mr. Pei was complimenting Ma Fei merely to entice him back to Hua Qing University. Mr. Pei subsequently contacted Ma Fei, inquiring about his choice of university. He assured Ma Fei that the door to Hua Qing University would always be open for him. Mr. Peng chimed in, urging Ma Fei to consider Jingdu University, promising access to top-notch resources. Ma Fei responded by stating he would observe others' tests before making a decision. However, internally he resolved to follow Chao, determined to surpass him in every aspect. Following this, Mr. Pei announced the continuation of the test, calling for the next participant. Ziyue stepped forward, identifying herself as a healer. After experiencing her healing abilities, Mr. Pei commended her, remarking that despite being only level 4, she could heal the entire party. The next participant, Zhuo Yu, created a barrier that successfully blocked Mr. Pei's attack. Impressed, Pei noted her remarkable defensive skills and the added bonus of reflecting part of the inflicted damage. Pei inquired about her talent and she explained it as her D-rank ability, reflecting 20% of the damage received. Pleased, Pei acknowledged the effectiveness of such a talent for someone in a meat shield role. Pei initially assumed that Fatty played a meat shield role, but to Pei's surprise, Fatty clarified that he was a mage, not a meat shield. Internally, Pei was taken aback, thinking, a 300-plus pound Fatty claiming to be a mage? He speculated that Fatty and Zhuo Yu might have their roles mixed up. Damn! My guy is body shaming the guy. Comment, let him eat in the comments to support our boy Fatty. Suddenly, Fatty launched his attack. Pei, confused, wondered what this kid was playing at, as he hadn't sensed any magic in the attack. Abruptly, Fatty declared ground explosion magic, leading to a massive explosion right beneath Pei. Taken aback, Pei realized that this unique talent couldn't be detected, causing him to lose 3 GP despite being a level 25 gunman. Impressed by Fatty's prowess as a level 5 mage, Pei considered the implications for others at the same level. Glancing at the principal, he inwardly acknowledged the need for closer scrutiny, suspecting hidden abilities behind the creation of five geniuses in the school. Next up was Chao, 
a level 7 necromancer with an unknown talent rank. Peng, surprised by Chao's higher level, pondered the mystery behind his undisclosed talent, speculating he wondered if Chao kept it a secret due to a low talent rank. Meanwhile, Pei contemplated the undead creatures Chao might summon, acknowledging that while he could tolerate injuries from new disciples, being hurt by Chao would be a different story. As Chao charged towards Pei, he questioned why the necromancer wasn't summoning the undead and speculated on Chao's possession of close-range, explosive necromancy techniques. Suddenly, Chao charged up a right hook. When Pei noticed that Chao wasn't summoning an undead, but attempting to punch him, he decided to allow Chao to hit him, assuming mages had low physical strength. This turned out to be a grave error for Pei as Chao unleashed a devastating 200 damage, sending him flying. A sense of shock enveloped everyone present, leaving them puzzled about how a level 7 necromancer could knock down a level 25 teacher with a single hit. Peng inquired about the situation, questioning how Pei could be overpowered by a level 7 necromancer, given the common perception of their physical weakness. He even speculated if Chao was a relative, suggesting that Pei might be going easy on him. Inwardly, Pei pondered the nature of this seemingly monstrous individual, acknowledging the near heart attack induced by Chao's powerful punch. The side characters were equally astonished, with one person suggesting the possibility of hallucination. Another speculated if the Chao they saw was an undead being summoned, with the real Chao hiding somewhere. The consensus was that a necromancer, known for their physical weakness, couldn't possibly send a recruitment teacher flying with one punch. Peng, too, found Chao terrifying, reflecting on his luck that Pei volunteered for the test, sparing him from being the one on the ground. When Chao inquired if the test was over, Peng acknowledged his passing, but noted the lack of a demonstration of his undead magic, making it challenging to assign a score. Chao asserts that it's okay, having meticulously pondered his decision to major in physical combat, akin to skilled warriors. Internally, he acknowledges that, given his current inability to wield magic, gaining admission to Jungdu University holds greater significance. Peng counters, asserting that specializing in a field divergent from one's own is unprecedented in educational history. He reaches for his phone, intending to consult the principal about the matter, and asks Chao to patiently wait. Making the call, Ping informs the principal of an exceptionally talented necromancer, expressing the desire for Chao to join the physical combat major. The principal, bewildered, seeks clarification. In a nutshell, Peng discloses that Chao is a level 7, and recounts the incident where he effortlessly dispatched a teacher from Hua Qing University with a single punch. The principal, astonished, expresses intent to personally invite Chao and initiates a video call. A holographic image of Principal Ji Ping Yang materializes, introducing himself and extending an invitation to Chao to join Zhengdu University. Chao interrupts, urging the principal to cease his formalities as he has already decided to enroll at Jingdu University. Mr. Pei successfully contacts his university's principal, conveying that they are somewhat tardy. Yet, internally, he acknowledges the capabilities of the other four individuals, resolving to advocate for their admission to the university. In a surprising turn of events, Ping Yang astounds Chao's peers by suggesting that, given they're all classmates, they should unite with Chao and support each other. The fellow students concur and decide to enroll in the same university as Chao. While Mr. Pei expresses dissatisfaction over Jingdu University attracting all the geniuses, Mr. Peng, on the contrary, rejoices, foreseeing it as the pinnacle of his admission career. Unexpectedly, Chao approaches Ping Yang with more inquiries, specifically about his father, An King. The principal is taken aback, questioning Chao if he is the son of An King and Xin Sa. Chao confirms, explaining the strong sense of familiarity the principal experienced upon seeing him. Chao then probes further, asking about the current whereabouts of his parents. Ping Yang reveals that Ang King and Xin Sa were his former students, but he hasn't seen them in over a decade. 
he can only share that they were remarkably talented individuals who often spoke about a private world. Despite his efforts, Ping Yang couldn't gather more information about them post-graduation, recalling only discussions about a mysterious realm. Ping Yang emphasizes that Chao must explore this private world as it holds something left behind by his parents. Internally, Ping Yang reflects that Chao's parents vanished without a trace for over 10 years, leading him to fear the possibility of their demise. Before concluding the call, the principal informed all five students that he would personally send them the acceptance letters once their publication was complete. He also advised them to familiarize themselves with the world related to their roles before the school started, emphasizing that such knowledge would garner even more respect upon admission. The principal wished the students good luck and vanished into thin air, ending the call. A week later, the fourth college organized the students into classes based on their roles in the alternate world, facilitating intensive preparation for scouting by elite universities. We found ourselves outside the gates of the mages' class at the fourth college, where the principal reappeared. He announced that it was the day for them to enter a world tailored for mages, cautioning that it typically tested mental abilities through logic and riddles. The principal assured them that united, they could successfully navigate the challenges. However, Fatty and Chow's chairs remained empty in their class, and as the principal explained the passing criteria, the scene shifted. Chow and Fatty stood before the sexy NPC with healthy melons, and an ancient stone portal door emitted a magnificent blue glow. Chow questioned whether they could succeed, while Yang, bored with the ongoing theory in class, yearned for real-life practice. He even explained to you that the increased number of people entering the specialized world together would significantly raise the world's difficulty. Therefore, it was better for the two of them to finish it alone. Fatty joyfully suggested to Chow that instead of carrying all the students of the class, why not just carry him? He even mentioned that if he truly wanted to increase his burden, he could venture into the specialized world multiple times, but he would forgo the rewards repeatedly. Fatty was head over heels with the NPC standing in front of him. Truly a man of culture, he informed her that he and his friend Chow desired to explore the specialized world of mages. Agreeing to their request, the elf instructed the system to generate a world for two players, specifically tailored for mages. Suddenly, the portal changed its color from blue to purplish, indicating the creation of a new specialized world for two players. The world was named the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons. Upon witnessing this, Chao hurried towards the portal, but Fatty halted him, questioning whether he intended to disregard the mission instructions. Surprised, Chao asked Fatty if there were even instructions to clear the dungeon. Fatty was perplexed when he heard these words from Chao's mouth. He promptly inquired how Chao managed to pass the Cave of Skeletons without any instructions. Chao gave an idiotic smile, and Fatty immediately grasped that Chao had forged his path by killing and slaughtering the skeletons on the way. And then he called him such an idiot. The elf, with a solemn demeanor, commenced narrating a tale to both of them. Legend holds that an ancient malevolent tribe once thrived in Qiandongnan. Their people were ruthless and adept at utilizing poisonous worms to afflict adversaries discreetly. A victim, poisoned, would suffer a grave illness, and the worms would proliferate, devouring flesh until the host perished. The mission's objectives were to locate this fabled evil tribe and eradicate all the venomous worms, with rewards contingent on their method of completion. The elf thoughtfully reminded them that the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons necessitated a group of five players. Since they were lacking three members, the system would automatically match them with three others. Upon entering the portal, Chow and Fatty found themselves in an ominous place alongside three strangers. Before them loomed a massive wall with cracks and a substantial gate constructed of heavy metal. As the three newcomers appraised Chow and Fatty, a vexed boy cautioned them not to impede the trio's progress. However, the girl from their team intervened, asserting that it was fate for Chow and Fatty to join forces with them. 
Introducing herself as Fang Yuan, a fire mage, and her little brother Fang Shun, also a fire mage, the third person, Long Chang, expressed annoyance. Chao and Fatty reciprocated with introductions and exchanged wishes of good fortune as they approached the formidable gate. The girl deciphered the five words above the door's frame. Morality and integrity provide peace. Realizing these words were instructions to open the door, she understood their significance. However, the brash boy declared his indifference to instructions, vowing to break the door down with magic. His overconfidence crumbled when his spell had no effect against the gate. The girl, displaying no surprise, pondered that the door might possess a certain immunity to magic. Meanwhile, the brat found himself baffled, realizing the necessity to engage his intellect. Conversely, when Chao discerned the door's magic immunity, a revelation clicked in his mind. The girl successfully decoded a portion of the riddle, asserting that morality and integrity symbolized protection. Nevertheless, Chao utilized his miracle of might, physically shattering the door. The trio of players stood bewildered, causing the girl to momentarily halt her deciphering efforts. The brat struggled to accept how effortlessly Chao broke the door physically. The system affirmed Chao's answer as correct, and the door finally yielded. In his typical fashion, Fatty praised Chao, who casually mentioned wanting to test if he could physically break the seemingly robust door without realizing its inherent weakness. Subsequently, all five entered through the shattered gate, finding themselves in another area adorned with red flowers. Across the garden, they spotted another door. Chao, however, observed an anomaly with the flowers and cautioned everyone to be vigilant. Regrettably, Fatty, inspecting his hand, declared it was too late. All five students succumbed to poisoning, losing three HP per minute. In panic, Fatty turned to Chao for guidance, who advised moving forward, emphasizing the peril near the poisonous flowers. Deep down, Chao felt the mounting tension, aware that his HP wouldn't endure if the poison persisted. As the newcomers brainstormed a plan, Chao pressed for time, sprinted towards the door, forcefully smashing it, asserting the urgency. The newcomers, expecting a puzzle-solving scenario, were astounded to find themselves progressing with minimal contemplation. The system extended congratulations for completing Mission 1, revealing the legendary evil tribe's lair, the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons. The students, astonished that the scenic locale was dubbed the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons, sought directions. In their search, a blue-haired girl named Xiao Dong appeared behind them, inquiring about their origin and expressing concern upon noticing their poisoning. She knew that the poison was from the Bian flowers and told them to hurry and follow her back to the cave of 10,000 poisons, promising them that she would get them treated. She informed them that if the poison gets too deep, they can't be saved by medicine. Everyone was surprised, looking at the mysterious girl. On the other hand, Chao was not able to comprehend how the girl appeared behind them without any trace and mentioned the cave of 10,000 poisons just when they needed to hear it. The fire girl advised them to get treated first as they didn't know what to do. Anyways, Dong ran towards a village screaming at her mum and dad, telling them that she had brought back some guests. Her mum was going to inquire about who the strangers were, but the girl immediately told her mother that they were outsiders who she met when she was picking medicinal plants in the mountains. She told her that the outsiders were poisoned by the Bayan flowers and asked her to brew a pot of five poison soup for them. Dong's mum hastily told the students to have a seat inside the house and got to work brewing the five poison soup. After a few minutes, the girl along with her mum and dad came to the group with the soup in a tray, telling them that the five poison soup was ready. Dong's mum served a gruesome looking liquid with worms, centipedes, scorpions and whatnot to the students. The brat immediately backed down from drinking when he saw the disgusting soup. He wanted Fatty to try the soup first because he had a more robust physique. But Fatty replied to him that it was not a robust physique, but just fat which was deposited on him. Suddenly, Chow took the bowl of the disgusting soup into his hand and gulped it down in one shot. 
He had to drink it quickly, because he only had half of his HP left. Once he finished his soup, he told everyone that the soup was not too salty or too bland and tasted great. He mentioned that the five poison soup was really helpful for him, as his poison status had now disappeared. He started persuading the others to drink up their soups and heal themselves fast. However, as soon as they drank the mysterious stew, they started vomiting and feeling uneasy. Not giving attention to their situation, Chao asked Dong to tell him about the history of the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons. Dong informed you that even she didn't know the origins of the tribe. But all she knew was that their patriarch asked them to avoid the outside world and banned them from using their poison magic unnecessarily. Dong's mom looked at the outsiders thoroughly and told them that the poison was now dealt with and all five of them were now safe. She asked them to leave as quickly as possible because the people in the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons were not very welcoming to outsiders. Dong retaliated to this behavior of her mum, telling her that she was chasing the visitors she had just received in their house. Dong told the students to relax and stay as long as they want. Chao thanked the mother and daughter, mentioning that your group would just stay for a little while because their bodies were not in the best shape due to them getting poisoned. However, deep inside, Chao was not able to understand the weird attitude of Dong's parents towards them. Dong and her parents got out of the room, ready to leave, telling the outsiders to stay there and rest as long as they wanted to. Suddenly, Dong and her parents looked at the huge full moon covered in the color of blood. The girl was suddenly happy when she knew that it was the full moon's night, telling her parents that something was going to start very soon. In the heart of a mysterious and shadowy forest, an enigmatic woman performed a ritual, summoning the grand insect swarm to bestow favorable weather upon the cave of ten thousand souls and shield the tribe's folk from maladies. In exchange, they proffered the freshest human flesh as tribute. As the woman's blood touched the well, a horde of insects converged, seizing two trembling individuals who realized they were destined for sacrifice. In a blink, the insects devoured their flesh, leaving only skeletal remains as evidence. Unbeknownst to the tribe, Yang and Chao observed the grim spectacle from afar. Chao, astounded by the tribe's barbaric customs, urged the group to flee, recognizing the danger posed by both the poisonous insects and the numerous tribespeople. Despite Chao's formidable combat prowess, he lacked area of effect abilities. Sensing their presence, the woman commanded Ju Si, a brawny tribesman, to pursue the students with orders to capture, not kill. As panic gripped the fleeing group, the girl turned to Chao for guidance, aware that if their true intentions were revealed, they would meet the same fate as the sacrifices, becoming insect fodder in an instant. Chao's mind was somewhere else. He heard a kind of noise and asked the others about what it was. As all of them turned around, they saw that they were surrounded by the human-eating insects. The fire mage used a fiery enchantment to protect them, and Chao started attacking the insects using his staff. The insects were too weak, and melee attacks were not giving him any stat points, but that much was a given because if killing insects would give him stat points, he would have done so long ago. Suddenly, Yang used the sand binding along with ground explosion magic, decimating the ants in one go and also breaking the house into pieces. Chao complimented Yang, telling him that it was indeed skillful to combine two of his talents together. But Yang told him that using these two skills in succession used up almost all his mana. Suddenly, Someone walked towards the group from behind, telling them that they've got some guts to kill the insect swarm. It was none other than the muscular guy, Ju Si, who followed them to the house. He told the five of them that he originally wanted to teach all of them a lesson, but he changed his mind because the outsiders used demonic magic to kill the insect swarm in an instant. Ju Si informed them that due to this behavior, they would have to become the food for the insect larvae and die with insects eating them alive. But as the guy was blabbering too much, Yang got annoyed and used ground explosion magic on him, dealing 11 damage. Even by this, the NPC was unfazed, 
telling them that the students were arrogant to try and hurt him with such petty tricks. Juicy was a normal level 10 NPC, with an HP of 300 and a strength of 40. His defense was 20, along with an agility of 15. He had the talents named Insect Bite and Poisonous Insect Control. The system revealed that unlike a wild monster boss, the NPCs in the other world would have their personal stats hidden until they take damage. Seeing this, the girl was now in deep fear, telling her companion that the mission in the Cave of 10,000 Poisons wasn't something newbies can accomplish. Even the boy was not able to understand how the five of them could defeat someone who is having the same stats as the boss. Even Chao was thinking about the difference of this specialized world from others. Not thinking too much, Chao ran towards the NPC ready to punch him. Juicy smiled while telling Chao that he was just arrogant for running over to him with his tender fists. He even taunted Chao once again, telling him that his arms were thicker than his thighs and he could take on ten weaklings like Chao with ease. But ignoring his constant blabbering, you gave him a heavy punch which he deserved, dealing 121 damage in one blow. Juicy was baffled, not able to comprehend how a mere human was able to hurt him. He instantly used his insect bite talent, greatly increasing his HP, strength, defense and agility. The Wind Mage was now deeply struck in fear, knowing that Juicy's stats had increased again, and the girl also noticed that his defense was also multiplied several times, with red eyes and a purple aura surrounding him. Juicy told the five outsiders that they cannot damage him anymore, and he will use their blood to pay respects to the insect swarm. But Chao was looking at him calmly, just like the silence before the storm. Just after some time, we see that Chao punched the NPC to his heart's content, leaving him with only 23 GP. As Ju Si surrendered in defeat, Chao asked Ju Si about the sacrifice that the lady conducted just now and about the identity of the lady who was ordering Ju Si around. Meanwhile, all three strangers were now afraid of Chao, knowing that Chao can be really scary. The NPC started blabbering everything out, telling Chao that the woman was their matriarch, who was conducting the insect sacrifice. The people of the Cave of 10,000 Poisons performed the insect sacrifice every month because they had signed a contract with the insect's Queen Mother for their protection. In exchange, the tribe's people had to pay respects to the Queen on the night of the full moon by performing the sacrifice. Ju Si informed Chao that the ancient green stone well was where the Queen Mother resided and reproduced. Finally, Yang understood and told Chao that Xiao Dong's family cured the group's poison because they wanted them to become the next round of sacrifices. Chao turned towards the NPC again, asking him the last question about why Xiao Dong called the tribe the Cave of Ten Thousand Souls, while the normal tribespeople called it the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons. But the NPC was surprised by hearing the name of the girl. He told Chao that there was only one person with the name Dong in it, in the entire cave of 10,000 poisons. And that was their own matriarch, Shun Dong. Hearing this, Chao thanked the NPC for his cooperation. Ju Si just wanted to run away from the group. But instead of letting him do it, Chao gave him a taste of his left hook, finally depleting all of the NPC's HP. The system detected that Chao had dealt with an NPC using melee attacks. So 10 points were awarded to Chao along with 50 experience points. With this, Chao leveled up, and five free stat points were awarded. Once again, as Chao had killed the first NPC with melee attacks, the S-rank item named Sage's Protection was awarded to Chao. It was an S-rank one-time use item that can negate one final blow when used. Chao smiled when he got the item, thanking the NPC for dropping it, because it was the highest ranked item in the other world. As the environment was silent again, the girl asked Chao about the next course of action, because one villager was deadly enough for the group, and if they were caught by the matriarch, they would not be able to beat her. Chao had an idea. The mission they were assigned to just needed them to exterminate all the insects, so they did not have to face the tribe's people. Necessarily, 
Chow decided that since the insect queen mother's nest was in the greenstone well, they would blow it up. The group agreed to the decision, knowing that they should act before Dong realizes what they did. The group arrived in the middle of the forest where the greenstone well was, but they were surprised to see that Xiao Dong's parents were killed by their own tribe's people. Chow looked at both of their bodies in shock, thinking that not all the tribe's people were bad after all. But as Chow was not able to do anything for them now, Chow decided that the group would just destroy the greenstone well and finish all this while they can. All three mages combined their spell attacks and Yang used his ground explosion magic to explode the greenstone well into pieces. After the dust cleared, they were left with a deep hole in the ground, presumably going straight to hell. After doing this, Yang was still not sure why the system hadn't notified them that they had completed the mission, even after all the insects had died. But suddenly someone behind them laughed loudly, telling them that they had all been naughty from the start. It was none other than the matriarch of the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons, Chun Dong, along with the backbone of the cave, Kuang Mang. Dong knew that the presence of the outsider's group at the Greenstone Well meant that her henchmen had died. It was really hard to believe for her that the group could kill someone as powerful as Ju Si. Chao was calm as well as frustrated, asking her if he should call her the matriarch of the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons, or Xiao Dong, as her secret was revealed. Dong asked Chao if he was not liking her current form. She was ready to change back into Xiao Dong, asking Chao about which form he preferred more. Dong revealed her intentions about sparing Chao just because she wanted to carry on her bloodline by doing naughty things with him. But it was not possible anymore, because Chao had killed so many insects. And if Dong did not sacrifice him, the Queen Mother would be very angry. Chao asked Dong about why she killed her own tribe's people along with her parents. But Dong's face suddenly turned expressionless as she told Chao that even if they were her parents, they were just two useless and disobedient pieces of trash. Suddenly, Chao's eyes gleamed in blue as he looked menacing and was engulfed in anger from her words. With a menacing tone, he says, So what? Dong and Chao stood face to face, their anger palpable, poised for a showdown. Dong, sensing Chao's ire, urged him to simmer down, assuring him that he'd soon meet Dong's parents. Before Dong could finish, she unleashed a swarm of insects from her mouth, aiming to strike Chao and his companions. The fire mage attempted to intervene with her flames, but Kuang Mang's sudden assault knocked everyone to the ground. Mang warned them not to disrupt the matriarch, declaring himself as their true adversary. A notification flashed, identifying Kuang Mang as their foe, an ordinary NPC with an active insect bite status, cloaked in a red aura. He boasted formidable stats, level 10, 500 GP, and a strength of 55, with defense and agility at 30 each. Like the NPC guards, he commanded poisonous insects, inflicting continuous damage on Chao. Realizing the overwhelming odds, Chao recognized the mission's perilous turn, teetering towards a suicidal outcome if they persisted in this battle. Chao started thinking about increasing his agility and defense to 166, just like his strength. If he did that, he would be able to make it through the mission with ease. He asked himself if he should activate the talent of Braveheart now. But suddenly, an idea popped up into his mind, and he was now determined that he did not have to activate the talent of Braveheart, because he could still revive once again by using the Sage's protection. Chow strategized that if he dealt with the Matriarch in the first place, who was responsible for the insect attack, he could easily win the fight. He leapt towards Dong as she looked at him while smiling frantically. She was happy that Chao was coming to the insects for becoming their food by himself without any forcing. But boy oh boy, was she going to get a surprise. Chao got closer and closer to the girl, but to her surprise, he punched a hole through her stomach. In one blow, Dong's transformation was undone and she was now in deep shock. Dong was angry and not able to comprehend how Chao could be such an ungrateful brat and not let the insects eat him alive. 
we come to know Dong was a level 10 rare NPC, and she activated her insect bite status. Her HP is 1000 and strength of 30. She had the defense of 20 along with agility of 50. She was able to shapeshift as a talent, along with poisonous insect control and insect bite. Chao was surprised to know that even when Dong was weaker than muscular NPC Ju Si, she was still a rare one. He knew that Dong must be mad at what Chao did to her stomach. Suddenly Dong increased her agility by 80 points in an instant, while telling Chao that he was a bad boy for making a hole in Dong's little stomach. Chao was shocked by this sudden surge of power in Dong as she charged towards him and did a fierce claw attack, piercing Chao's chest straight in the middle with her hand. Chao coughed out blood as his HP was now only at nine points. He did not know that agility could be increased in a split second, and due to it, he didn't even have time to react against the incoming attack. Dong smiled as she saw that her attack was successful. She told Chao to relax because when he would be dead, Dong would skin him and keep it as a souvenir, as it would look great while hanging on a wall. As Yang saw his friend's pathetic condition, he screamed and tried to run towards him, but Mang blocked his movement by giving a heavy blow to him. Mang told the other students that they should concentrate on fighting with him and should not dare to be distracted by others. Suddenly, Yang used his sand-binding attack, but it was different this time as the sand was now red in color. Seeing that, Mang finally noticed that the sand was actually red and the attack may be more powerful, but it was too late for him. Yang used his ground explosion magic and gave 312 damage to the NPC in one blow, scattering the NPC's body into molecular pieces. As the smoke clears, we see that Yang was now a handsome boy and was unrecognizable by the others in his fat-burning state. His spirit was now almost near 300. Even the fire mage was not able to recognize him at all in his new looks, as Dong was standing along with Chao while her hand was still inside Chao's chest. Seeing the transformation of his friend, Chao was surprised and asked him about what he did. Yang told Chao that even he didn't know how it happened, but the moment he got anxious, all the fat onto his body burned away, and now he had almost 300 spirit points. Chao was shocked to the core by hearing this. He knew that Yang's spirit points were almost as much as some mid-tier mage. Suddenly, an idea struck into his sharp mind as he grabbed Dong by her hips and told Yang to use ground explosion magic on both of them together. Yang was bewildered upon hearing this request from his best friend. He told Chao that if Yang used his attack, Chao would die along with the enemy. But Chao once again screamed at Yang, telling him to have a little trust in his friend and do as he says. Yang was finally determined upon hearing these words and used the ground explosion magic on Chao as well as Dong. Hearing that, Dong was scared to the core. She screamed at Chao, threatening him to let her go because she didn't want to die with him. But Chao smiled as he told the lady that it was too late for them now and nothing could be done. As soon as Chao said those words, both of their bodies exploded along with the ground beneath them, causing a huge eruption like a volcano. Yang and the Fire Mage were shocked to know that their friend was no more. But suddenly, a notification popped up in the sky, telling everyone that as lethal damage was detected to Chao, the S-rank equipment Sage's protection has been activated, and the instance of the damage was now negated. Suddenly, another notification popped up, and we come to know that as Chao showed courage in the face of death, the A-rank passive talent strong contract has been awarded to him. It was an A-rank contract which increased the player's strength by one point for every 50 points of HP. It would also increase the player's HP by 10 points for every point of strength they had. As the smoke disappeared, we see that Chao was revived once again. He smiled onto his fate, thinking that the system must have not wanted him to die so soon. He knew that as he had 166 strength, his HP would be increased by a whopping 1660 points. A status window popped up, and we see that Chao was a level 8 student with a strength of 167, with the double damage effect along with a defense of 6 and agility of 9. 
He still had the lousy spirit of zero with a manner of 300, but he was now having his HP points reaching almost 1,800. Chow was happy that he would not be killed in one hit anymore by any boss. Now seeing that Chow was back after being dead, Yang ran towards Chow in surprise, asking him about why he was alive when he was hit by a 300 spirit attack. Chow turned towards his now slim friend and told him that he never said to the group that he couldn't revive if he ever died by mistake. Changing the topic, Chow asked Yang if Dong dropped anything after he killed her. But Yang suddenly noticed that he did not get a notification after he killed the lady. That only meant one thing, that the matriarch was still alive. As the smoke from the explosion clears, we see that Dong was starting to appear in a distance, cursing both Chao and Yang for being a real pain for her. With hidden eyes and an ominous smile, she congratulated both of them, as they will get to admire her true beauty soon. Suddenly, Dong started laughing intensely, as it was revealed that she was now completely turned into a mysterious creature, which was unknown to the system. It notified the players that the creature was at level 15 with an HP of 2000 and a strength of 130. It had a defense of 80, along with agility of 100. The creature had new skills separate from the matriarch, which included poisonous sting and plundering violence. Chao and Yang were shocked upon this revelation of Dong's new form. Chao knew that she was now super strong and asked Yang to cast another ground explosion magic on her once again. But to his disappointment, Yang informed Chao that he can't use the attack again because his spirit was back to 48 points. It was revealed that the increase in Yang's spirit from his fat-burning state was a temporary phenomenon. Suddenly the red system notification started popping up, warning the players that the boss of the Cave of 10,000 Poisons has been strengthened by an unknown power. Its difficulty was now far exceeding from what new players can handle, so the system wanted them to leave the world immediately. But to Yang's surprise, instead of leaving hurriedly, Chao wanted to know about what will happen to their custom world after they left. Yang turned towards his friend, telling him to escape from the monster first, instead of thinking about the mission. The system answered, saying that the players have not defeated the Queen Mother, who was the boss of the cave of 10,000 poisons. They will have to restart the custom world once they get out. Reading that, Chao dropped the idea of leaving the world at all, because the principal specifically told Chao to pass the custom world at all costs. Chao taunted Dong that no matter what she was made of, she would surely die today. But the monster, who was once known as Dong, smiled upon hearing this as she told Chao that there was no way that he or his friends could injure the powerful body she had now. Finally, Chao and the monster clashed with each other while damaging each other by their attacks. We see that Chao was dealing more damage than Dong as he rapidly struck the monster with his fists. Even Dong was not able to understand why Chao hadn't died yet. He was only level 8, but he was doing more damage than Dong himself. Even Dong, who was now a powerful monster, was afraid of Chao, not knowing who was the real boss of the world. On the other hand, Chao continued with his attacks as a blue aura was coming out of his eyes continuously. The monster suddenly told Chao to wait and asked him if Bai Zhe was the one who sent him. According to the monster, it must be Bai Zhe who can create a monster like Chao because he was the one who made the boss itself. However, since Chao was clueless about what the creature was rambling on about, he clarified that his identity was solely Chao. With a leap into the air, he brought down his staff with force upon the ground, dealing a hefty blow to the monster, inflicting 213 points of damage in a single strike. The monster, once human, felt a jolt upon realizing that his foe shared the surname Chao, causing her to ponder if her master had sent him to eliminate her. She wondered internally why her creator would seek the demise of his own creation. With the defeat of the monster boss named Dong, the system detected that Chao had triumphed over the unnamed creature through close combat, rewarding him with 15 stat points and 75 EXP. Chao glanced at the screen, his eyes still emitting a blue glow as the system commended him on leveling up.